So what does this anti-inflammatory diet look like? That, as I said, is the same diet that's an anti-cancer diet and it's an antiviral diet. It's lots of high fiber plant matter in the form of fresh vegetables and fruit. It is micro boosting whole grains and legumes that contain what we call MAX, M-A-C, microbiota accessible carbohydrates. So that's the oats and the brown rice and the lentils and all of that. And it's the option of a small amount of protein and fat from animal sources for patients who need it, but your gut certainly doesn't need it. So this is a, just a conclusion from an article in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings from, from years ago, well before COVID. And what that told us is it was a, a special article about biodiversity in the human gut. It told us that greater microbial diversity is associated with better ability to deal with stressors like pathogens. And it told us that individuals with a disease are more likely to have alterations in gut microbial communities and low diversity. So remember that early quotation from Hippocrates, it is more important to know what sort of person has a disease than what disease a person has. What sort of person has a disease? Individuals with a disease are more likely to have alterations in gut microbial communities and low diversity. Individuals with a disease are more likely to have disruptions in their gut microbiome. And where does that greater microbial diversity and richness come from? It comes from what you eat. It comes primarily too. I mean, if you're taking antibiotics every day, that's going to be a problem too. If you're taking acid blockers, that kill stomach acid, that decrease stomach acid and disrupt the natural pH in the gut, that's a problem too. But by far and away as adults, and one could argue as children, the number one, and I say, I make that caveat with kids because the kid's microbiome is very tender and sensitive to the effect of drugs. So don't medicate your children unless it's really necessary, particularly antibiotics. Be very thoughtful about that because those first thousand days which is about the first, you know, three years of life when the microbiome is really forming is when it, you know, destroying microbes in young babies at that age can lead to serious problems later on in life. And that's actually how I got interested in this field because my daughter was C-section, my breast milk dried up after six weeks. I got antibiotics during delivery. She got antibiotics at birth. She got put in the NICU, the neonatal ICU, even though she was healthy because I had a fever and I had the flu. They put her in the NICU just in case. They gave her potent IV antibiotics at birth just in case. And again, she didn't have the benefit of a vaginal birth. My breast milk dried up probably as a result of the antibiotics. And she proceeded to basically be sick almost every day for the next three or four years she received about 20 courses of antibiotics before the time she was two. And she was a very, very, very sick infant and child until I sort of had my aha and realized that all these frequent antibiotics were making her worse rather than better. And I want to be clear here. I'm a physician. I'm in a very good position to assess for my child, whether she needs antibiotics or not. I want to remind you that please involve your healthcare practitioner in that decision. Okay, so I'm not in any way advocating that you stop giving your children antibiotics, but I am strongly advocating that you really question that need for antibiotics. Studies show that pediatricians prescribe antibiotics 67% of the time when they, 63% of the time, pardon me, when they perceive that the parents want an antibiotic and only 7% of the time when they don't. So there's a huge gray zone there for when an antibiotic is really necessary. So again, this greater microbial diversity, better ability to deal with stressors like pathogens. We want our kids to have a fighting chance and to have a fighting chance, not just against COVID and other viral pandemics to come, but against autoimmune diseases and allergies and asthma and obesity. They need to have a healthy microbiome. But to get back to this idea of the number one predictor the American Gut Project, a couple of years ago in 2018, published a study where they looked at over 53,000 participants and they found, and I'm sure other speakers throughout the conference have mentioned this or others will, because this is really a landmark study. They found this magic number of 30, 30 different plants a week, not 30 plant servings, different plants. Eating 30 or more different plants a week no matter what kind of diet you want, whether you're a vegan, vegetarian, omnivore, 
that was associated with a much healthier, more robust microbiome. And eating 10 or fewer plants was associated with a much less healthy microbiome. So, you know, for those of you out there who are picky eaters, who have picky eaters, where you're like, yeah, I eat vegetables every day, but I only eat broccoli and carrots. That's two. That's two a week. Broccoli and carrots are great, but you need to really think about the variety. So I have a couple food rules that I'm going to be sharing with you. Not really food rules. I'd say food guidelines that I share with patients. And um, I've had to modify them beyond just the servings of vegetables to really think about different types of vegetables. Okay, let's keep going because I want to make sure that we have the full time for uh, our Q&A. And okay, so now I want to tell you, I want to use everything we've talked about to tell you this study, which is not going to come as a surprise to you now gut microbes predict severe COVID-19. This is a study from last year, and it showed that the most reliable predictor of outcome, death, ICU, need to be on a ventilator after COVID was a microbiome. It was more accurate than age, gender, presence of comorbidities like heart disease, lung disease, et cetera, inflammatory markers that they check in the blood, like C-reactive protein, et cetera. More predictive than all of that was the health of the microbiome. The composition of the microbiome predicted severe respiratory symptoms and death with 92% accuracy in this study. And what were the two main things? High levels of Enterococcus faecalis, you might remember that as one of the bad bacteria on an earlier slide, correlated with poor outcome. Low levels of my best friend, Fecalobacterium prosnitzii. If you don't have enough F. prosnitzii, chances are you're not going to do well with COVID-19. And how do you get a lot of F. prosnitzii? By feeding your F. prosnitzii fiber. I mean, I wish I could make it more complicated and sexier than that. You know, sometimes people come to see me from far away. I had a patient came from Australia once. I've had people come from France. And I'm sitting there sometimes struggling, like, how can I make this seem worth the trip? Eat more vegetables. You know, I mean, yes, that's a simplification, right? There's more to, to digestive diseases and eat more vegetables. But I'll tell you, eat more vegetables is a really big part of the message. So, F. prosnitzii, just to remind you again, great for heart disease, colon cancer, diabetes, obesity, and COVID. So, this is one of my favorite things to remind people it's less about the potency of the pathogen and more about the health of the host. And when I say health of the host, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about your microbes. So it's less about the potency of the pathogen and more about the health of your microbes. So what should we be eating? Eat more plants. That's simple. Michael Pollan in his great book, In Defense of Food, said, uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I will add to that with just eat more plants. Even if you're already eating a lot of plants, eat more. Choose your carbs carefully. And by that, I mean, you know, carbs kind of have a bad rap by some people. People think carbohydrates make them fat, which is completely not the case. But you want to really distinguish between simple carbs that are going to release a lot of glucose into your bloodstream and cause a spike in insulin secretion, which can cause a lot of those calories to be stored as fat and create other metabolic disturbances versus complex carbohydrates. So the grains and the legumes and so on. And also uh, things like resistant starches and foods that are high in inulin. I know you've had a lot of food talks um, during this, so I'm sure people have explained those concepts, but basically these are starches that act more like fiber in the body. Ferment your food. We didn't really have much time to talk about that, but fermented foods like sauerkraut and kimchi are the rock star combination, powerhouse combination of prebiotic and probiotic. Prebiotic because sauerkraut is made from cabbage and cabbage is a high fiber food that's feeding your microbes. And then also probiotic because as the cabbage is fermented, it creates a lot of lactobacillus. So you're getting a two for one and fermented foods are really rock stars for the microbiome. And there are lots of studies showing that eating fermented foods regularly, particularly fermented foods that are fermented in small batch that you acquire from a farmer's market rather than the shelf stable ones in the supermarket um, can be actually more impactful than a probiotic in some cases. Eat dirty food. By that, I mean, eat food with dirt on it from the farmer's market. 
when I buy stuff from the grocery store, I mean, every carrot is exactly 4.2 inches. It's a perfectly orange color. And it just doesn't look like anything that came out of nature versus a farmer's market where the carrots are ugly. They have little bumps on them. Sometimes a carrot looks like it has like a second little piece coming out. They're stumpy and they're, they're not necessarily that attractive, but this is how nature made them. And this is how you can guarantee that you're getting food that is grown with exposure to soil microbes. It's not industrial farming in a warehouse. It's actually grown in nature with exposure to soil microbes so that when you eat it, in addition to the nutrients, you are also getting those microbes. So support your local farmer, whether the farmer's market, participate in a CSA, community supported agriculture, manage your meat intake. There are lots of reasons to eliminate meat completely. It's good for the planet. It's great for the animals. And it's really good for us. But if you are somebody who feels like that's not a step that you want to make or can make, manage your meat intake. And so I recommend to my patients not more than one animal protein meal a day. And that doesn't mean eggs in the morning and then like a cream sauce on something at lunch and then meat at dinner. Those are all animal proteins. So if you're going to have, you know, a big bowl of scrambled eggs in the morning, then have salad for lunch and rice and beans for dinner or so not more than one animal meal a day. Say no to sugar. It's so hard or eat, you know, dark chocolate, things like that, but try not to eat large amounts of refined sugar. We don't, you know, I'm not going to try and convince you that sugar is a drug or any of that, but sugar is not great for you. Right. So don't eat too much of it. Maybe you don't say no to sugar every day, but try and eat less. Say yes to the farm, no to the factory. People sometimes will have these arguments with me. They'll show me a bar, a nutrition bar and be like, well, they start reading the label. It has 14 grams of protein and this net carbs and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yes, but where was that made? Can you show me a tree? Can you point to a picture of a tree where that, you know, breakfast bar (laughs) fell from, was picked from? So food that makes a stop in the factory on its way to you, try and avoid that, which means yes to an apple, not so much to applesauce. Yes to lentils, not so much lentil chips, right? Because in the factory, those foods are processed. I mean, remember, we can make car tires from corn, okay? So that should tell you something about how we can process food. So yes to the farm, no to the factory. Avoid franken foods. It's foods that have been genetically modified, foods that are highly pesticides, grown with glyphosate, artificial sweeteners, things like that. Things that are, don't exist um, in nature, typically. Follow my one, two, three rule, which is one vegetable for breakfast, two for lunch, three at dinner. Quite frankly, I flip that most days because I like to start my day with a green smoothie, which is typically at least three or four vegetables. In mine, I use, I typically use a coconut water base, just unflavored, unsweetened coconut water. And then I will use collard greens and kale or collards and spinach, depending on what I have. I put in a stalk of celery. I always try and put in some fresh parsley for flavor. And then I'll put in whatever fresh fruit I have, nectarine, mango, kiwi, maybe frozen pineapple or mango if I don't have fresh, a little squeeze of uh, lemon juice and some ice. So typically, I mean, how many plants is that? Not counting the coconut water, it's the kale, the collards, the parsley, the celery, the lemon, and the fruit. So that's six right there with, I mean, that's all six in one go. But um, my one, two, three rule is really for vegetables. So you wouldn't get credit for the lemon with that. So I used to just tell people six servings of vegetables a day, but now I tell people six servings of different vegetables a day, right? Not just the same broccoli, broccoli, broccoli. And that's important because of what we know from the American Gut Project about the variety of plants. Okay. These are some of the foods that we tell our patients to emphasize. Fermented foods, um, foods that are high in inulin, onions, leeks, leafy greens, cruciferous veggies, garlic, another high inulin food, asparagus with asparagus and broccoli. Remember to include the stems because that's where most of the fiber is. It's not in the broccoli floret, it's in the stem. So chop that up and make sure you're including that. Green bananas, chicory root. Again, these are examples of resistant starches. Uh, radicchio, carrots, radishes. I mean, everything from the ground basically is good. So if I were to ask you in this final moments together, before we go to the Q and a, if I were to ask you, 
what you think the biggest predictor of health is, or I could turn the question around and say, what do you think the biggest predictor of poor outcome to COVID is? Is it obesity? Is it heart disease? Is it diabetes? Is it asthma or cancer? Is it a mood disorder or being very stressed out? Is it autoimmune disease or metabolic syndrome? It's actually your microbiome. It's, you know, those trillions of microbes that inhabit our bodies, mostly our gut, that are the most accurate predictor of health, of outcome to viral illnesses like COVID. And, you know, you can't have a healthy microbiome if you're eating Cheetos and cheeseburgers, like you have to feed it the right food. And I just, I saw this picture and I just thought it was just so beautiful. I mean, it really is like, you look at this picture and I feel healthier just looking at it, not even eating it. I mean, it's a bowl. It looks like some quinoa and seeds and broccoli and some citrus and maybe some beets and avocado and sprouts. And I mean, it just, you feel healthy looking at it. So I want to introduce this idea of immune bliss. So my first book is called gut bliss, but this concept of immune bliss, which is going to protect you from cancer and infection and autoimmune disease and allergies begins with a high fiber diet. And that leads to a balanced immune response. And that leads to an anti-inflammatory response and that leads to resistance to illness. So again, all disease begins in the gut. Uh, Hippocrates said it a few thousand years before I did, but I second that. And uh, my first book, Gut Bliss, second book, The Microbiome Solution, third book, The, the Blow Cure, and my new book, The Antiviral Gut, that I have been laboring with for over a year and just went into be copy edited, will be out actually fall 2022. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of that book. I have to say, I learned a ton. I read about somewhere between eight to 10 articles a day for the better part of a year writing that book. There's a lot of immunology and microbiology in there, uh, in addition to the GI stuff. And it, it sort of had a different purpose. You know, the purpose for gut bliss was really to help people recognize what can go wrong in their GI tract and fix it. The microbiome solution was really to drill down more into the microbiome and autoimmune diseases. The bloat cure was a fun, quick, you know, A to Z, 101 things that bloat you, kind of a page each. But with the antiviral gut, I realized that, you know, people were dying. People were not understanding the relationship between what's going on in their gut and, and their susceptibility to illness. And again, not to suggest that, you know, I can prevent people from dying necessarily, but a lot of these deaths we know are preventable based on the comorbidities that people have and what is really driving a lot of this disease. So it felt like a very different mission and purpose. And I'm, I'm really proud of it. And I hope you all buy it when it comes out. <music>